So good morning, everyone. I am John Anthony Estoliosa. I'm a teacher in the Ateneo de Inilo. Currently, I'm teaching contemporary Philippine arts from the regions, but in the past years, I have been teaching uh, English literature and poetry, classical mythology, as well as contemporary Filipino literature. Today, we will be talking about pandemics in classic literature, and it's a very unusual combination, pandemics and literature, classic literature for that matter. Undoubtedly, the talk of the town in the past months have been COVID-19. So we'd like to see how our favorite stories fit into the context of a pandemic. I entitled my presentation as A Plague in the House. So you might be asking, what's the inspiration for that? Actually, it came from William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. The third act, the first scene, we find Romeo entering, and uh, together with him is Mercutio and Benvolio. He encounters, or rather they encounter, the Tybalt and uh, the Capulet people. Mercutio, as usual, is spoiling for a fight. He taunts Tybalt, and uh, a fight ensues, a sword fight where Mercutio was mortally wounded. As he is dying on scene, he shouts, a plague of both your houses, they have made worms meet of me. Surprisingly, he shouts this, he repeats this line three times before finally dying. So, a plague of both your houses. What's interesting is how the film Shakespeare in Love reinterprets the making of this line. In the film, we see Joseph Fiennes as uh, William Shakespeare, a very young William Shakespeare, walking the dark, dank streets of 16th century London. On the street corner, he encounters an itinerant Puritan preacher who was condemning the theater as hubs of evil. So he shouts, I say to both theaters, a plague of both your houses. And Shakespeare raises an eyebrow, oh, that's a good line. And the next time we see it, it's already part of Romeo and Juliet with Ben Affleck as a very dramatic Mercutio. But it does reveal to us the context of Shakespeare's time and how that context influenced his writing, which in turn captured and how should I say, how should I say this, embedded that historical segment into great literature, something that even modern audiences can relate to in the literary sense and in a more contemporary sense. The first understanding that we have of pandemics in classic literature is that they are essentially divine retribution. They are seen as punishment from the gods. And consequently, a manifestation of divine wrath if the gods are displeased with the conduct of mortals, they send disease as punishment. On screen, you can see the image of the Furies, or as the Greeks call them, the Erinias. In mythology, we understand or we encounter them as avengers, especially for those who commit murder. They drive the murderer to madness until he or she finally destroys himself or herself. In other stories, we see the Erinias as bringers of pestilence. And uh, pestilence, in the sense, is essentially associated with a plague, a pandemic. The Italians call it uh, la pestilenzia. And poet, poets from other, other time periods called the plague as the pest, so as, uh, as we shall find out later. So to continue, we are of course familiar with the story of Moses, how he called upon the wrath of God on the Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And if I can recall correctly, the fifth and sixth plague is of course uh, pestilence and uh, boils, the Egyptians uh, developing boils all over their body. A very striking clue, which will have repercussions in 
more recent literature. Coming back to mythology, the first mention perhaps of a widespread plague, or at least an origin of how it came to be, is found in the story of Pandora. Just a refresher, it all started with Prometheus, Pandora's story that is. Prometheus commits the unspeakable crime of giving mortals divine Olympian fire. As such, Zeus and the other gods and goddesses were enraged. And as punishment, we have this, uh, this beautiful creature. It's essentially a misogynistic story where Pandora is gifted to Epimetheus, the brother of Prometheus, and with her comes a box. Some translations call it just a container. It doesn't necessarily point out that it's a box. With the express warning that it should never be opened at any cost. Curiosity got the best of her. And as we know, she opened the lid and out came into the world. Disease, famine, evil, immorality, pestilence, the plague, death. Yes, she shot the lid back just in time to save hope. And uh, if we think about it, that is what keeps humanity going on, despite the evils of the world. So there's the first mention of, uh, of the plague, of a pandemic. And it didn't help that 2019 ended with memes like this. In other narratives, we encounter, for instance, in the more lengthy stories of Homer, we see great conflict. But what is usually omitted in these uh, epic tales is how they came to be and the little details that somehow influence the course of the narrative. Homer's Iliad opens with a description, not, not just a description, but an invocation to the muse, which gives us an understanding of what has been going on already. It starts in media res, in the middle of things. So you take, you take the Iliad, you open it the, on the opening chapter, and then you read, sing muse of the wrath of Peleus' son Achilles, whose wrath drives to the underworld countless souls uh, from the Greeks. We understand that it's about conflict. It's about conflict between man and man, uh, man versus nature, man versus himself. And the story ends not with the sack of Troy, but with the funeral games for Hector. So it's a princely story. What Homer omits is the grand preparation and even the backstory of how the conflict came to be. But there is a very telling fragment which somehow gives credence to the idea that pandemics or plagues are punishment from the gods. This uh, uh, fragment is told by Euripides in his play, Iphigenia in Aulis. The story uh, happens before the, before the Greeks got to Troy. So Agamemnon and Menelaus were gathering the Greek forces. And one day, while he was hunting in the island of, uh, in one of the smaller islands in Greece, he manages to kill a stag. And while doing so, he boasts of his skill. I am as good as Artemis, the goddess of the hunt. Artemis, having heard this, was enraged. This was essentially hubris, pride that defies the gods, something most hateful to the, to the divine. As punishment, Artemis withholds the winds that would have brought the Greeks to Troy. It didn't help either that Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo and whom the Trojans are very much devoted to. So there it was. There's a situation. The Greeks have no way to get to Troy. Whereas a pestilence ravaged the Greek camp to the point that Agamemnon had to plead for some sort of respite. And so he asks, what does the goddess demand? And Artemis replies, a blood sacrifice. I want you to sacrifice your daughter to me, Iphigenia. 
So Agamemnon, great king as he was, calls for his daughter. And the daughter, not knowing her fate, was being bound to the altar. And there, she was killed. She was screaming and crying because she doesn't know what, what's happening. And Agamemnon had to do that foul thing, which will have certain repercussions in future narrative. Some versions say that Iphigenia was not killed. Uh, Artemis rescued her before she was actually sacrificed. But it does give us a hint on what the, the divine demands for, for wrongdoing. We are perhaps more familiar with the story of Oedipus. He was fated to kill his father and marry his mother. Something, un something unusual because it was prophesied and yet it is most hateful to the gods. So having fulfilled the prophecy, he begins to wonder why is Thebes being ravaged by plague? To quote Sophocles' lines, the god of plague and fire raids like detestable lightning through the city, and all the house of Cadmus is laid waste, all emptied and all darkened. Death alone battens upon the misery of Thebes. Slowly he begins to ask, who is this man who killed the king? And slowly the clues begin to point to him. And you know the, how the story ends. He cannot bear to see the children that he that he fathered with his with his mother. So he plucks his eyes out. Going back to the narrative of Agamemnon, we see that even a sacrifice invites more bloodshed. In Aeschylus' Orestia, he talks about what befalls the Greek king when he went home to Mycenae after the Trojan War. Upon reaching home, his wife, Clytemnestra, butchers him in his bath. Orestes' his son points out that it's murder, it's still murder, and that Clytemnestra must be punished. So murder here is compounded with more murder. And to add to that, a certain pestilence breaks out again in their, in their territory until Orestes was able to make some sort of restitution to, to the crimes committed by his family. In the same parallel idea shared in, the, uh, in classical mythology, Sophocles puts in the mouth of Oedipus the question, how shall we read ourselves, rid ourselves of the plague? And then Creon, his brother-in-law, replies, by exile or death, blood for blood. It was murder that brought the plague wind in the city. It's a topsy-turvy world, classical mythology. It's nothing like the disney version that we see. So that existential dilemma of how to navigate through life without displeasing the gods and goddesses have always been associated with the ills of the world. To the point that Sophocles writes, or rather makes his character say in the play that one should not consider anyone happy until he is dead. And that fatalistic point of view persisted even during the Dark Ages, during the height of the Roman Empire, during the High Middle Ages. And it eventually found its way to literature that somehow we are more familiar with in terms of language. Perhaps the last semblance of pandemics viewed as divine retribution surfaces in Geoffrey Chaucer's uh, The Canterbury Tales. It's a pseudo-religious work, though in content it is far from religious. So a group of people are on their way to a pilgrimage to Canterbury, to the shrine of St. Thomas of Canterbury. And then they are people from all walks of life. There's a priest, there's an abbess, there's, there are nuns, there's a pardoner, there are merchants. And on the way, they share stories. Well, considering that that's their best form of entertainment at that time. And in the pardoner's tale, he gives us a cautionary story of what happens to people who boast about not being afraid to die. And in doing so, 
the partner takes on a certain segment of life during Chaucer's time. Something very recurring, uh, very, very much familiar to them. That is the plague, the Black Plague, which has been raging in Europe around the time. In the partner's tale, we encounter the three loafers, carefree young men, you know, just sitting around in the tavern, and then they hear the bell, the tolling of a funeral bell. And then he asks, rather, one of them asks uh, a passerby to give them the identity of the person right? who's the guy being buried today. And then we have this segment from coming from that person. There came a creepy thief, they called him death, who kills us all around here and in a breath. He speared him through the heart, he never stirred. And then death, death went his way without a word. He killed a thousand in the present plague. And sir, it doesn't do to be too vague if you should meet him. Somehow there's that futile sense that all men must die. And you know how the story ends. They encounter an old man who told them that death is waiting for them under an oak tree. They reach the oak tree. There's a pile of golden coins there. They ask the youngest to get them food and drink from the town while they prepare or rather while they keep the golden coins. By the time the young man, the youngest one, has returned, he has poisoned the wine. They killed him, and then they drank the poisoned wine and died in the process. And as the old man said, like what he said, rather, they found death under the oak tree. So it's something embedded in their consciousness. Death lurks amongst us in the form of a plague, in the form of a pandemic. And considering the medical expertise at the time, they really couldn't do anything much about it except try to avoid it. In Bruegel's painting here, you find characters from all stations of life, from kings, knights, cardinals, priests, common people, farmers, and they all fall under the, under the influence of the Black Death. Somehow, people during that time be began to transcend the idea that it's essentially just a divine retribution thing. They begin to see the pandemic also as a social phenomenon. And it is ironic to think that pandemics in literature have become the trademark narrative of some cities. Okay. One big story comes to mind, which we shall be discussing in a while. And going back to the theme of this year's uh, book festival, it's a city built on books. And yes, there are cities embedded in literature that it wouldn't be that story without that setting. Okay. Like, can you imagine Les Miserables without Paris? Or any novel of Victor Hugo for that matter? Think about that. Think of Charles Dickens without his London. It wouldn't be the same. You cannot detach the character from, from the setting. The, uh, the organic setting of the, of the story. Well, it's a tragic story. These are tragic stories, but apparently they become the stock of legends. And let's admit it, they are great entertainment. That's, that's the secret of tragedy. They, we, they appeal to us because we relate to them, and in the process, we are entertained. So moving on. I mentioned before that there's one great story which captures the city as its anchor. And that is uh, Giovanni Boccaccio's Il Decameron. The Decameron is simply a collection of 10 stories retold by the characters in 10 days. So there, there are 10 of them. I think five, four, four gentlemen and six ladies. They were passing by and then they decided, oh, you know what? The plague is raging on in Florence. Why don't we go to a house, lock ourselves in, and tell stories? And that's what precisely they did. They just told stories. And in the introduction of the first day, Boccaccio paints a backdrop of how the plague was going on in Florence at that time. According to him, the plague did not declare itself as it had in the East, where a nosebleed was a sure sign of inevitable death. In both men and women, it began with certain swellings in the groin or armpit, 
some of which grew to the size of an ordinary apple, while others were egg-shaped and of different sizes. So this is the infamous bubonic plague. So how did people react? How did the medical personnel treat the situation? Actually, it's, it's quite vague because there was no medical advice or medicines that seemed to be effective against the disease. Either there simply was no cure or those ministering to the sick did not know the cause and for that reason could not provide a remedy. So what did people do? They tried to avoid the plague, like what the storytellers have been doing. Almost all tended to arrive at the same callous decision, which was to keep the sick and their belongings at a distance, believing that in this way they could save themselves. And this idea have so captured the minds of that rather the imaginations of writers that they told stories over and over again of how people kept themselves in an enclosed area and you know uh hoarded be uh, their belongings resources and tried to keep the plague at bay of course we understand these are the well-to-do people one good example of that story or that uh, setting of a story is Edgar Allan Poe's The Mask of the Red Death. The Count Prospero, very aptly named, decides that for him to escape the plague, he must keep himself into his, in his fortress. So he does that precisely to the point that Edgar Allan Poe even describes that within there was only the good and the beautiful and outside there was only the plague and death. He sat there, the Count stayed there, secure with the idea that even the plague could not penetrate his walls. And lo and behold, in the middle of a masquerade, someone dresses up in the costume of Red Death, something very symbolic of the plague during the time. The Count, of course, was infuriated. How dare you mock our proceedings here by dressing up like that? And so he thought it was just another... Uh, party goer and upon looking at the face of of the character he dies confirming our understanding that even beyond safe wall uh, even inside safe walls no one is technically safe from the pain that image of a grand masquerade ball and the character of red death entering has so inspired other interpretations to the point that it was even incorporated in Gaston Leroux's The Phantom of the Opera. You can recall the part where there's the masquerade ball in the Paris Opera House. And then in the middle of that, the phantom enters in costume of the Red Death. At least that's how Andrew Lloyd Webber interpreted the story. A much more recent reinterpretation of the same scenario surfaces in Neil Gaiman's uh, The Sandman, Endless Nights. In the story, Death and Venice, Death stops the enclosed uh, the enclosure and enters there. However, Neil Gaiman is kinder. He gives death a more how should I put it? A more appealing characteristic compared to that of Edgar Allan Poe's and Gaston de Luz. So there it is. The plague as a social phenomenon which makes people come together or pushes them away from each other. So let's proceed to my final point on how classic literature has portrayed pandemics. This is one of my favorite scenes from one of my favorite Shakespeare plays. This is Kenneth Branagh in Hamlet. He holds a skull in the graveyard scene and then he utters the famous line, Alas, poor Yorick, I knew him Horatio, a fellow of infinite chest. To think that someone who makes people laugh is reduced to a skull. So the plague as memento mori. Memento mori translates to uh, a remembrance of death. And since we're talking about a remembrance of death, I'd like to share something with you. This is our unofficial theater mascot. Okay? We call him Hamlet. And this guy is almost in every production of ours. It, we use him as our unofficial mascot because it reminds us that even though we try to portray life on stage, what we are portraying there is actually a fleeting semblance of what real life is. So during the time of uh, the plague, or at least the outbreaks of plague, memento moris begin to surface as well in artworks, in literature, 
in in painting, even in sculpture, and even in architecture. You know, skulls adorn uh, uh, designs of houses. Okay, so let's talk about Shakespeare. How did the plague affect him? Mr. Tilney was, or Edmund Tilney was the master of the revels, meaning he's the one who opens or closes the theaters, depending on the circumstance. In other words, he's the official censor. We mostly encounter Shakespeare as film. Much Ado About Nothing, Merchant of Venice, and of course, Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet, which every grade nine student has probably watched or was required to watch. But let's keep in mind that these are plays. These are meant to be performed. You know, people ask, oh, have you read Shakespeare? No, you don't read Shakespeare. You perform Shakespeare because Shakespeare wrote for the theater. So let's keep that in mind that he was primarily a playwright. Of course, we do not discredit his beautiful sonnets or his uh, Venus and Adonis, which I think is one of the best pieces of English poetry. But we cannot detach Shakespeare from the theater. And we cannot disregard the idea that theater is primarily a communal experience. People need to be together to watch a play. Oh, unless it's a special performance and you're the only one in the audience, which is quite absurd, right? Hence, the, the theater-going experience is very much dependent on the feasibility of the circumstance like well if there's a play you can go together as, as a group it, hence it is not a surprise as well that during these precarious times shakespeare has to continually remind his audience look there's a play going on i'm going to describe to you how it looks i'm going to remind you that there's an infection going on and any one of us here can get infected and he does so in the most subtle ways, where he inserts the lines, like what we have encountered before, like a plague, uh, a plague of both your, on both your houses. So there it is. He calls a bad, uh, the rule of a bad king as an infection on the land. So here are hints, small hints from, from the bard that captures the times. And in doing so, gives us somehow a manuscript or a blueprint on how they live their lives with a pandemic. In 1665, some few de decades after Shakespeare was uh, Shakespeare died, there was another outbreak of the bubonic plague. And uh, mercifully, there was the great fire next year. That's why it's a great tragedy, but somehow it purged the city of the infection. It didn't help that London wasn't that you know, wasn't that gorgeous as we see it today. According to Adrian Tinniswood in his book, By Permission of Heaven, which talks about the Great Fire, London in, the 16, in 1666 was not a pleasant place to live in. It was noisy, filthy, and smelly. And most Londoners agreed that only Paris was worse. The plague was captured in poetry by John Milton, who writes in his Elegy, Silent I sat, dejected and alone, making in thought the public woes my own. And first arose the image in my breast of England's sufferings by that scourge, the pest, how death his funeral torch and sky to fan, entering the lordliest mansions of the land, has, la has laid the gem human palace low and leveled tribes of nobles at a blow. So it doesn't care whether you're rich or poor, you're your royalty, you're a commoner, it kills without choice, without making, uh, without making sharp distinctions. So it was not a surprise that the great fire the next year was somehow welcomed by Londoners because it cleaned them, it cauterized the city from infection. So there it is. And to presentation i'd like to talk about one of the most defining pieces of literature that talked about pandemics what would be a what would a french algerian city be remembered for so i'm talking about of uh, i'm talking about albert camus uh, the plague and i 
recommend this because it's practically the situation we are in right now. Oran, it's a city in uh, North Algeria, had an outbreak of the bubonic plague. As such, the entire city was placed under lockdown. So what was life like in lockdown? Throughout September and October, the town lay prostrate at the mercy of the plague. There was nothing to do but to mark time. And some hundreds of thousands of men and women went on doing this through weeks that seemed interminable. You could see them at street corners in cafes or friends' houses, listless, indifferent, and looking so bored that because of them, the whole town seemed like a railway waiting room. So there it was. All of them were waiting. Apparently, they did not put themselves in quarantine because they practically loafed around. One striking episode in the story is that even though the town was in lockdown, shows and performances were still going on apparently. And they had this false notion that when you're in evening dress or evening gown, you are immune from the plague. And so Albert Camus inserts this absurd situation where the, you know, the upper classes in the city still went to watch an opera, ironically, again, from Greek mythology, yeah, Orpheus and Eurydice. And in the middle of the performance, this occurred. And as though the singer had been waiting for his cue, or more likely because the faint sounds that came to him from the orchestra seats confirmed that what he was feeling, he chose this moment to stagger grotesquely to the footlights. His arms and, le and legs played out under his antique robe and fall down the middle of the property sheepfold, always out of place, but now in the eyes of the spectators, significantly appallingly so. So you can imagine the singer dropping dead of the plague right in the middle of an operatic performance. Talk about a dramatic ending. And so the reaction was, you know, everyone just said, the orchestra just stopped. Everyone just stood up and quietly walked out and probably quarantined themselves for the next two weeks. But it's, it's very telling on how people react to a widespread disease that generally has still not been diagnosed or at least um, assigned a certain uh, vaccine or serum for, uh, to cure it. So there it is. So to recap, three perspectives in classical literature, literature surface when we talk about pandemics. First, it's essentially a manifestation of divine retribution. The gods are angry, hence we have the plague, hence we have a pandemic. Just look into the stories of Greek and Roman mythology and even in early English literature and you have those stories. Second, eventually from that point of view, it developed or transcended into the idea that ah, pandemics are actually a social phenomenon. People, it can bring people together, it can pull them apart. And how, and the interplay of this it's essentially great literature, which we have seen the stories of, of, uh, of uh, Boccaccio in the Cameron. Then eventually we arrive to the more philosophical understanding that the plague is a memento mori. It reminds us that death is inevitable, but that doesn't make it a bad story. There is a certain appeal to tragedy, which we see in the beautiful plays of William Shakespeare or in the novels of uh, of the mid-victorian era okay so to end i think it's most appropriate to give suggested readings after all it's a book festival so these are the stories that i suggest you read if you really want to know more about pandemics in classic literature read about sophocles uh, sophocles's the oedipus cycle not just the first story because eventually you'll find out ah it didn't end with oedipus punishing himself there is something else. There is a redemption aspect in the story. The Orestia talks about Agamemnon's fate after the Trojan War. And personally, I think this trilogy is long overdue for a film of its own. Quentin Tarantino, the Orestia awaits. And of course, the, our trusty Edith Hamilton for generic reference for mythology. I would also like to recommend uh, the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer and, of course, Il de Cameron. There's an English translation and I think there are free copies over the internet. 
try to read uh, Edgar Allan Poe's Mask of the Red Death as well. There are flamboyant and exquisite stories not set in the United States, but in you know, exotic places like uh, Florence, Venice, and it captures the, the gothic darkness of these stories. Something very attractive at first, and at the end, there's always a grisly ending to it. So these are the stories that I recommend, and I do hope that you've learned something from my short lecture today. So with that, Madame Ogilvy Salamat.